Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Welcome everyone to Girls on Film. It's so lovely to be back here at home. We've had such a great time here this year. We're at home in Manchester for the last of six editions spread over 2019 as part of Home's season celebrating women in global cinema. And we certainly celebrated women at Girls on Film at home. We had Miranda Sawyer and Francine Stock come here at episode eight. We discussed Dirty Dancing and Madeline's Madeline in episode 10. We had Maxine Peak, episode 15, Local Hero, that went down a storm. And we had Wad Al Khatib in episode 20. He's just won four biffers, so that was rather timely. And today I've got some fantastic guests to welcome shortly. We're going to review some current releases. We are going to look at some Christmas films because it's December and why not? Let's get a bit festive. Girls on Film had its first birthday a couple of months ago and this is our 25th show. So it's been a pretty good year, I've got to say. We were named the number one feminist film podcast in Stylist magazine. And then last month, iNews named us as one of the top four film podcasts in the world. Alongside Kermode and Mayo, the Empire podcast, and Karina Longworth's You Must Remember This. That is very cool. We're very excited about that. Women in the industry have given us fantastic support. Cameo Productions, thanks for all your support. Mubi and Barbara Broccoli, who runs that whole James Bond shebang, she gave us an amazing quote. She said, more than 50% of moviegoers in the UK are female, but nearly 80% of critics are male, which is why you must listen to Girls on Film. So that made us very happy. And actually really excited to see the new Bond film because word on the street is it's a little bit better on the female perspective this time, so fingers crossed. Basically, you're in for a treat. Thanks for joining us. Okay, now on to um, some current events. We have a new initiative that's got underway on the 25th of November. It's called 16 Days, 16 Films. It's 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, and it's an initiative by Modern Films with the Caring Foundation. And I was on the jury last year, and this year's jury includes Tandy Newton, Alice Winnicott, and Jodie Whittaker. So if you go online, you can check out some of this amazing work by female filmmakers. This year, I am on the jury of Bumble's Female Film Force. Now, Bumble is uh, kindly funding five short films led by women. So uh, last year we met and, well, earlier this year actually, we met and saw some pictures from amazing women about their short films, which have now been funded. Those films are Sunita, Ascending Grace, Eshak Nui, Viva La Feminista, and a film called Mom about Queen Victoria. I am absolutely delighted that the director of Mom is joining us here. She is a screenwriter for Doctor Who and the playwright of the Victorian female boxing drama, The Sweet Science of Bruising. Please put your hands together and welcome Joy Wilkinson. <laughs> Hello, Joy. Hello. Thank you very much for coming on Girls on Film. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to hear how it's all been going because I last saw you when you were standing pitching this, yes. this great Terrified. film. <laughs> um, actually, could you sum up what Mom is? Yes, and as Helen Mirren taught us in The Queen, it's it's Mam, like Jam. Mam. Yeah. Mam, not Mam. I mom, wasn't like listening to Helen, was it? <laughs> right, um, got it. So Mam is about Queen Victoria after she's had her ninth baby and is suffering from what they called a continuance of hysterics, which we would now call postnatal depression. And in order to cheer her up, Albert has this brainwave, because she loves photography, that they should do this photograph of the perfect family of them and their nine children. And of course, that's the last thing a woman wants when she's spiralling. So it's kind of funny and dark and moving journey uh, towards becoming what's effectively the first Insta mum, you know, sort of. Wow, yeah. It started that whole trend of, of having pictures of how you look and then what's really going on behind the scenes, wow. which doesn't match up to it at all. And how was the experience of the shoot and working with Bumble and Female Films? 
It's just been an absolute pleasure from start to finish. Even that terrifying pitching session was lovely because it was a bunch of women who were just all looking at you, encouraging you and, and, and understanding and, and asking encouraging questions. So, so it kicked off brilliantly. And the crew and the cast and everybody at every step of the way has just been lovely and it's kind of ruined me for the future, I'm sure. But <laughs> there was a point where the baby was supposed to be asleep. And of course, the baby wasn't asleep. Well, the baby was asleep and then they set the lights up and then the baby oh woke up and I just on the spot sort of changed what was happening in the scene so that it worked perfectly if the baby's awake and the first AD afterwards was just like you know I'm so used to directors going berserk if something like that happens and you think well why would you because it's nobody's fault that the baby's awake but actually it, you just felt because it was such a supportive environment that everybody would just pull together and make things work so Brilliant. you know now I just want to do it again and again well, I can't wait to see the finished result yeah. so we're all going to be able to see that early January yeah I look forward to it brilliant and of course you worked on Doctor Who mm. which is terribly exciting you wrote the episode Witch by the General I think we have got a clip from that oh have should we have a look Thanks. yeah feel that security system kicking back in sucking every more cell back back down into pendle hill back out of the bodies they hijacked have peace no i will not go yes you will burn the wind woman she was a witch she confessed so you got what you came for i have vanquished sin no more witch hunts yay oh Jody bravo round of applause for that i mean great episode and jody as you say how amazing female doctor who totally bossing it yeah, yeah yeah i mean how much are you kind of given when you write an episode for that i mean how much freedom are you given well we kind of start off in a story room um where we pitch stories and then talk about them as a group but that was very much my story you know i come from pendle and and always wanted to do something about the witches so it's kind of your story but but they're a resource to kind of bounce ideas around with and i think it makes a difference being a woman writing a story like that even though when we came up with the story i didn't know it was a female doctor at all so oh, really? it That's wasn't interesting. i didn't come up with it to explore that yes. um but then probably around draft four i found out it was jody and then yeah oh right now we can sort of have some fun with this because it, cool. you come up against all these barriers you can't just save the day if you're a woman in the 17th century i don't know vinay patel uh, one of the other writers did because he's sort of stats nerd he did this sort of word count thing on all the scripts and worked out that mine had women talking more than everybody else's and oh. and percentage wise and I think even though we can all write anybody I think there's just something in you where you're just more interested in them you know and you also um, very briefly did a play The Sweet Science of Bruising yeah Tell yeah a bit about that. so that's about the little known phenomenon of Victorian lady boxing and uh, it's just that great image of women in crinolines and corsets with boxing gloves and once I knew that they existed you know that there was no stopping me and I wanted to write a play with four protagonists where you actually don't want one of them to win <laughs> you kind of want them all to win somehow <laughs> I remember one of my friends at the interval just said oh I don't know who I want to win and I just love that I just love that there is a different structure that we might bring to the world I love that actually yeah. I was just talking about hustlers with someone and it's ah. in a, in a similar thing in that it's not necessarily directing you to feel a certain way yeah it's just real people yeah brilliant so our second guest on Sunday I was at the Biffers celebrating this year's greatest achievements in British independent film I was on the main jury who awarded Joshua Connor best actor for only you and there was also a jury for new work the new jury who awarded Harry Woodliffe best debut director for the same film only Lou so please Please welcome Harry Whitliff, who is indeed a woman. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, so, give us a clap. You've seen only you. Yes, and what a fantastic film it is. Can you set up the scene for us? Um, it's a love story. At the centre of the story is uh, the problem that the couple can't conceive a child, and it's really about the narrative of your life not developing as you expect it to or want it to, and how to sort of embrace what you have, really. 
beautifully put and it's I thought it was a wonderfully sensitive film Thank and you. Ter- incredibly naturalistic performance from Yaya Costa and Josh O'Connor who we now know um, for being Prince Charles in the crown um, but let's have a little look at a clip oh tickle oh <laughs> dang tell me telling you me what if I am a little bit older than than I said I was. What do you mean? Like I'm not 29. How old are you? 32. So what made you explore that age gap thing? Because it's such an interesting subject. I think I wanted to turn every cliche on its head, really sort of the subject of women and their biological clocks ticking and being desperate for children and waiting for a man really winds me up. So it's not that women aren't allowed to yearn to have a child or decide they don't want a child, but I really wanted to make a decision that she was really happy on her own before she met Jake. Mm -hmm. It's him that suggests they have a child. He's younger than her, she's older, which generally is... You know, we don't we don't see on cinema. There was quite a lot of pressure to to close the gap as well. We had discussions like, it's okay that she's older, but let's just, what about five years or four? I was like, well, then it isn't really an issue. And also, the whole point was, I want to show a woman in. There's always this idea, thirty, and you you know, you're over the hill, or thirty five, you're like uh, nearly forty, and you know, to just cast an actress who's gorgeous, and it's not really, it's not an issue for them, and it sort of doesn't become an issue for us as an audience. And then, ironically, it's not that, you know, she wants a baby and he's not ready. It's that he wants a child and he, he wants them to kind of move forward with their lives. Uh, and it was interesting, I, in a Q&A recently, a, a young guy actually said to me, he felt like so many cliches were turned on their heads. And he said, there's a scene where she wants to have sex, so sort of so they, they can have their child. But also, she's the one that suggested, sort of seduces him. But And he's not in the mood, you know, he's tired and... And he said, I've never seen that. You know, it's always the woman's tired and the woman doesn't want to have sex mm-hmm. and the man wants it. That's and he so said true. it was really nice to see it, even as a man, you know. That's great. Isn't that yeah. wonderful feedback? And it's so yeah. true. And I love this one because you don't feel like it's a deliberate kind of turning the tables. It's just such an, an immersive, naturalistic film. Like, I think a lot of the best dramas, you feel like you're sort of spying on people. It's so intimate and it doesn't feel pointed. I mean, yeah. what were the challenges for you getting that intimacy across? You know, I, I wanted it to feel like people would think it was improvised, which it isn't. Um, so just very loose. If it's going to work, you've just, you know, you've obviously just got to invest in these characters. And, and I wanted to show her, I mean, it's really about an imperfect life, you know. It's, mm-hmm. it's having the imperfect relationship, which is perfect, you know, mm-hmm. because the fall in love, you know, you're, you're lucky to get that and then to find a way through it and have your ups and downs and reinvent your relationship is a privilege. How are you feeling now that you really pushed to turn things around and push back on the age gap and all those things, yeah. all that hard work, and now yeah. you've won, you won at the Biffa Awards? I just feel like my theory was right, that if we make them really s- specific, people will relate to them. I think, ironically, the more specific characters are, the more relatable they are for some reason. And they're never going to be everybody, you know, never going to match everybody's story. They had to be unusual, so they weren't a cliche. I didn't want people saying, well... Because there was pressure as well to make her older. Like, shouldn't she be older and not be able to have a child? I was like, no, because I, I really don't want people coming out and going, well, she left it too late. And I don't want to be supporting this theory that women just forget to have children and put their careers first. You know, I think the main reason women don't have babies earlier is because they haven't met the right person. And, uh, yeah, it really winds me up. So to not make her older, keep the age gap big. And also, I think the big thing for me as well is to make... A film where the woman... I think a lot of women relate to this film and their story is not anything like the story of only you. You know, someone would go, oh, I don't, you know, I've not had children, I don't even want a child, and but I really, I really got her. And I, I think it's because she behaves like a woman. And I feel like um, she's strong and she's emotional and she's, she's not, she doesn't behave like a man. I think we're given... It's like when we have strong female characters, we're trying to make them like a man and go, look what, what a great character is. She's just as strong as a man. It's like, <laughs> but maybe we should all be as, in inverted commas that you can't really do on a podcast, as weak as a woman. You know, maybe we should all be more in touch with our emotions. We we, we should all be um, 
communicating about how we feel more. You know, we shouldn't be avoiding conversations. You know, maybe that is strength. And hopefully people see how, you know, how, how brave and sort of stoic she is as well. So, yeah. And it was interesting in the edit how much discussion we had about her and never, ever about him. So mm-hmm. interesting, yeah. isn't it? So interesting. Now, I'm sure some people who haven't seen it, you really want to see it now. So where can <laughs> they so. see it? Yes, It's on... Curzon Home Cinema at Great. the moment. It's had its um, cinema release. But yeah. yeah, you don't have to be a member. You can just Great. You can go, just in like there. go in there, buy it. Yeah. And what are you up to oh, next? It's out on DVD too. Yes. Oh, yeah. great. Good stuff. Yeah. I am about to shoot a film in March with Ruth Wilson starring. So oh, Fantastic. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah, she's very cool. Brilliant. Well, stay with us. Thank you for thank joining you. us, Harry. Uh, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our reviews section and to look at some new releases. We're joined by the Chief Film Critic for The Independent and the BBC Regular. Please welcome Clarice Lockery. <laughs> Hello, Clarice. Welcome back, I Hello. should say, because you joined us. I move, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you were on before, we talked about Midsummer and Tell It yes. to the Bees. Sorry to mention bees, because you have a bee phobia. Yes, I did talk far too much about my bee phobia, which was a bit No, I was in, I was intrigued, and it was relevant, but we're going to move on from <laughs> that. Do you have a phobia of female sort of spies or anything like that? No, I have the opposite. Good. So we're going to talk about Charlie's Angels. So it's directed by Elizabeth Banks, stars Chris Stewart, Naomi Scott and Ella Belinska. Let us have a look at the trailer. Welcome to the Townsend Agency. We exist because traditional law enforcement can't keep up. I don't like that, boy. You guys are like lady spies. Dane's former MI6. Oh, God. What did you do to Sven? I compressed his carotid and deoxygenated his brainstem. Well, that sounds painful. Don't worry, he's gonna wake up. Unless he doesn't. Sabina runs the ground game. See, I know stuff. Let's get the weapon before it becomes every bad guy's favorite new toy. Take her to the closet, gear her up. We're gonna need some wigs, toys. Feisty. Clothes. Ah! So in the first closet. There's another closet. Oh my God. So, very glamorous. Yes. Lots of action. A plot fairly perfunctory, I thought. It doesn't make a huge amount of sense, and I could probably <laughs> not describe it to you right now. <laughs> I don't think anyone really could. I mean, think they have to get gadgets and things and, yeah, yeah. you know, typical spy kind of. And there's an Alexa, but it's bad. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. They also seem to do things in quite boring locations like kind of big um, industrial estates, which I thought was not very exciting. Yeah, they all look like locations for Pitbull videos. (laughs) I was just waiting for him to walk in and be like, hey! (laughs) But Kristen Stewart... What do we think of her in this? I actually thought she got me through this film because I thought she was actually had a chance to really shine and actually be funny which is not normal for her to be fair yeah i don't know if if i've ever seen her in a straight comedy like this and it's really proven that she can do anything because she hits every joke her performance like she gets to be so weird in this she's just that that weirdo that has no filter and i loved seeing that because usually i think in her drama performances she's quite restrained and mm-hmm. she, she really kind of pulls into herself and to see her do the opposite here which is so much fun on its own she was good and they stopped short of making her explicitly gay or bi which i thought was a shame but she definitely got that vibe yeah she like looked at a woman for two seconds yeah. so that was it that was a so concession was like, okay <laughs> we could have done a bit more here what do you think of the other actresses in this i think the big sort of positive of this is that they got that trio perfectly I think the characterizations were just perfect too. I, they should have bounced off each other perfectly. Mm-hmm. I think if the script had worked, because you have you have kind of the weirdo that's Kristen Stewart. You have Naomi Scott, who, who's very much the newbie who just goes around going, "I don't know what's going on." Ah, ah. And then you have Ella Valenska, who's James Bond. And my struggle with this film is that every scene, I was like, "Why are they not clicking in the way that they should?" Yeah. yeah. And why aren't the jokes landing? This is so frustrating. I love Elizabeth Banks. She's so funny. She's so talented. It's just one of those weird movies where all the pieces are on the chessboard, but something hasn't gone right. 
I have to agree, and it's a shame because I really wanted it to work, and I certainly had some fun watching this film, you know, sitting there with your popcorn. It passes the time quite pleasantly, but it doesn't quite come together, and I agree, Elizabeth Banks did better with Pitch Perfect too. I thought. Mm. I thought she got, she brought the comedy and the characters out well in that. Yeah, so w- would you recommend anyone go see it? Mm. Probably not. Probably not, which is a shame because female director and female... Exactly. Great that it's been made, let's just say that, and women <laughs> should be allowed to fail as well as succeed or do all right work at least Elizabeth Banks has made a film, so that's We're good. allowed to be mediocre. Exactly. <laughs> Judy and Punch is our next film. This is a very, very interesting film. Um, this is directed by Mira Folks, and it stars Mia Wasikowska and Damon Herrian. And, of course, it is an inversion of the Punch and Judy story. Uh, let's have a look at the trailer. They've come to report a crime. Right. Excellent. My dear wife and tiny baby are missing... Do you remember what happened to you? That's the way to do it! <laughs> Does that little punchy guy always win? You won't be winning anymore. The greatest show is what the critics say. <laughs> <laughs> So Judy and Punch, as you can see, it goes into the kind of relationship between the puppeteer and his very long-suffering wife and the domestic violence that ensues. I want to come to you first, Joy, because obviously this must be an area that you found rather interesting as a kind of fantasy film that touches indeed on witches. Yeah, yeah, I am its kind of perfect audience (laughs) in some ways. Um, What I like most about it was the world that she created, really, and that she was allowed to create that world um, and that she's not just having to make the sort of usual realist non-genre film that, that women get sort of channeled down and she's obviously having a ball with it and and it's 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 this kind of fantasy fairy tale world there's sort of mad scottish people and australians and it's it's this real hodgepodge of people crazy people really um and then within that she does this really unusual narrative thing that's a kind it is like a medieval morality play they kind of aren't real people and they're not supposed to be so she's doing something in a very objective way and even though it is Judy and Punch and it is kind of her revenge story Judy's not in it all that much she's she's quite sort of sidelined and she's with this interesting bunch of women in the forest who are kind of, it's almost like a, a women's refuge or something. So, so it's very interesting things going on. And voice-wise and originality-wise, I, I applaud it massively. But it's, it's very offbeat. <laughs> it is, yeah. I, I loved it for that. I, yeah. you know, I don't know about you, uh, Clarice, but I came out really joyful, which, which is weird because it is a really, really dark it film. It is dark, yeah. But something about it was so fresh and original and exciting. What did you think? I think it's interesting that you say about being allowed to make that film because I wasn't 100% sold on everything, but I came out with this feeling of, I'm so glad she got to make Mm. this movie because it must have been so hard to walk into a room and try and pitch that and say, you know, it's fantasy, but also it's got modern touches. They reference Gladiator in it. And And it's funny, but it's not a comedy. Yeah. It's dark, but it's not really dark yeah and there's you know there's domestic violence in it and then some of it's really weird and goofy and I think for that to be your first film Mm. and to to be so bold with it and to go so outside of any box any reservations I had about it I'm kind of like well I definitely want to see her next film I think, yeah, I think it's, it's that way you go, whether she's the next Gilliam or any of those things, you want to be in her world and, and hear her stories. Yeah, because that's her first film. Like, mm. I mean, the next one. It's a really a wonderful achievement, I think, to be celebrated, that she's done something so original, yeah. as you say, yeah. and entertaining. And visual. It's very yeah. cinematic and should be seen yeah. on the big screen. And there's one moment that is good to see with an audience, and that's all I'll say about oh, that. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I think it's a big reaction. I think yes. I know what you mean. Yes, very good <laughs> point. All right. Now we're on to Marriage Story, which is out um, already, and it's in Netflix on the 6th of December. I believe we've all seen this one. This is directed by Noah Baumbach, who's one of my personal faves. Um, it stars Adam Driver and Scarlett Hansen, and it is actually the story of a divorce rather than a marriage, so the title is somewhat ironic. Let's have a look at the trailer. What I love about Nicole, she is a mother who plays, really plays. 
What I love about Charlie. He loves being a dad. He loves all the things you're supposed to hate, like waking up at night. She knows when to push me and when to leave me alone. He never lets other people keep him from what he wants to do. Dad, you're too far. I know. It's not easy for her to close a cabinet. He's incredibly neat. She's brave. He's brilliant. She's He's very, very competitive. competitive. I'll tell Charlie what's happening, and Cassie, you then hand him the envelope. I just get nervous. Can you unserve? What do you mean, like take it back? Charlie and I are getting a divorce, Mom. You can't be friends with him anymore. Dreamer! Charlie Bird! <laughs> Mom! <laughs> Mom? <laughs> Mom! So that's Marriage Story. I enjoyed it, um, but it is quite a sad film. I mean, it's, it's a funny film, but it's not exactly full of optimism um, but I wanted to come to you first Harry because obviously you've made a very intimate film about a relationship what do you make of this one yeah I loved it really I thought it was so moving I mean I was sort of crying after about five minutes but it has a hopeful uplifting ending as far as it could be with you know a marriage splitting up I thought it was just so beautifully structured and funny and so acutely observed and uh, actors were amazing once again, it is refreshing to see a story told this way. And actually, what I quite like about it is saying, you know, relationships can be wonderful and sometimes wonderful relationships end. But let's not just say that was all a waste of time. Exactly. So as maybe yeah. that's the optimism you're talking about. Yeah. It's just I, realism. I think when something is as good as that, it's it's always uplifting because it's just a transcendent piece of art, really. And the honesty with which he confronts his flaws, presumably, you know, it, it feels very based on experience. Mm. And, and he just, was married to Darren for Jason Lee. Exactly, so, yeah. and it's so honest. And he manages this even-handedness of of showing how awful they both are, but how brilliant they both are, and, and that these terrible things happen without it being... It's interesting that it's in California, the no-fault state, and actually it isn't anybody's fault, and you see the humanity in that. Uh, and I think point of view-wise, it's really interesting because it's very even, and as much as it sort of is his story, he's very much on her side. Yeah, I, lo I loved how even it was. It was something yeah. I aimed for in Only You to make it very much, you know, you're not, it's not one person's fault. To think mm. Things, arguments are not one person's fault. Clarice, what did you think of it? Basically all of those points, <laughs> um, but also I thought the performances as well in this were spectacular. And there's one monologue that Scarlett Johansson has that is quite long and, and so heartbreaking, and it reminds me so much of one of my favorite monologues, which is from Frances Ha, where Greta Gerwig is talking about when you see someone on the other side of the room and you look at each other and you just know, and it's sort of the reverse of that because it's the heartbreaking death of love monologue. <laughs> and it's so interesting how spending that sort of concrete time with a character who is just talking, no interruptions, you at the end of that feel so close to her. Mm. You feel so close. You feel like you've known her for years, and that is such an achievement, I think. So I think we were recommending Marriage Story. Must yeah. be. Yes. And watch out for it come Oscars <coughs> time, mm. as we've said before on Girls on Film. Now we're moving on to something a little bit festive, guys. Christmas classic. So we used to um, do the Bechdel test, as uh, regular listeners will know. And we're also developing a Girls on Film test. And we thought we would put some Christmas movies to those tests and talk about them from that kind of perspective. We've talked about um, that a film should have complex characters and complex women in a pivotal role. Any suggestions for other criteria we should be looking at here? I think it's women being flawed. That's really right. important. Yeah. Yeah, women yeah. showing lots of diverse emotions people seem to have trouble with. <laughs> Good shout. And I was going to say growth as well, I think, because you usually see the woman through the man's point of view, and from that point of view, they kind of stay stagnant because they symbolise something. Yeah. But when you actually see a woman go from point A to B, yeah. it's sort of rare, yeah. <laughs> upsettingly rare. Even amount of nudity. In my film, Laia Costa uh, said, every time you see my boobs, we've got to see Josh's bum and so i made sure we saw josh's bum within the first 10 minutes of the film which i think improved the film actually. bravo and thank you <laughs> uh, yeah, quite right so joy we have asked you all to choose a film or two and you chose actually one of my personal favorites edward scissorhands yes. from 1990 directed by tim burton and indeed scripted by a woman yes. let's have a look at a wonderful clip from edward scissorhands those are your hands What happened to you? Where are your parents? 
parents. Um, your mother, your father. He didn't wake up. Are you alone? Do you live up here all by yourself? What happened to your face? Hmm. No, I won't hurt you. But at the very least, let me give you a good astringent, and this will help to prevent infection. Beautiful film, and also very interesting from a female perspective when you kind of revisit it. Hugely, Joy, how did you feel hugely, about that? Because what I'd remembered from watching it when I was younger was the, the love story with the Winona Ryder character and Edward, and obviously his name's in the title. But watching it now and realizing it's a female screenwriter, I realized it's a film about a middle aged Avon lady, and uh, you know, she starts the film, she's the one who's driving a lot of it, and actually, it's this crowd of women on her cul de sac. There's seven or eight middle aged women of all shapes and sizes who are really driving things, and it's really radical. And actually, the Winona Ryder character doesn't come in until about an hour into it, and, and also, even then, you can tell that a woman's writing her because she's been off in the mountains shagging her boyfriend, and that's not, a, you know, there's no judgment on that. There's sort of jokes about her having a mattress in the van with him but actually she's just a regular girl and she's not particularly likable she doesn't even pay any attention to Edward for ages of it so it's not like she's she's a Disney princess waiting for her prince she's not at all and actually we're watching her mum and what's going on with that so I was really impressed with it re-watching it and you still get the payoff of the love story and the tears rolling down your cheeks. But by the end of it, you've got Winona Ryder's character as the old lady telling her granddaughter this story. And it's although there's the, the romance of this sort of lost love affair from her youth, you also see she's had a full life and got a granddaughter and she's not actually, you know, pining after her first boyfriend at all. It's it's really radical and I put that massively down to Caroline Thompson and I, I did a bit of digging about her and oh, it's, this is what sort of breaks my heart. There's this quote from her where she says something like, I'm very happy to be known as a writer of offbeat stories and that's great that she's satisfied with that. You know, she did The Adams Family and she did Welcome to Marwen. But I kind of think, yeah, but hang on, like, is Wes Anderson not that? Is Yorgos Lanthimos not that? Is Paul Thomas Anderson not that? And actually, when a guy does it, they're a visionary genius. And when she's doing it, she's she's sort of off to the side writing her offbeat stories. And, and that's why I'm so pleased about Judy and Punch, because actually that's stepping into the hey with my offbeat story i am a visionary genius and i think that's what needs to happen that's a great comparison and it will be really interesting to see if mirror folks actually does get hailed as that or whether yes. people still have that kind of inherent bias that they think oh that's a man's yeah. area you yeah know? oh she's off to the side doing yeah. that but actually all the great filmmakers have got an odd world view that yeah. they're taking you into yeah, thank you for bringing Edward Cezanne's back to our attention. And I agree, it does have complex women, and, it, and it's very interesting from that perspective. Clarice, now you chose The Apartment from 1960 by Billy Wilder. Tell us about the film and why you chose it. So this is both one of my favourite films, period, and my favourite Christmas film, because the kind of films that really move me on a, a sort of deep existential level are the ones that aren't necessarily hopeful, Mm -hmm. because this film, I mean, not to spoil it, ends on a very ambiguous note. So Jack Lemmon's character has the titular apartment, which he's just gone into this very strange situation where he keeps lending it out to all his bosses and other executives so that they can come with their mistresses and be out of the way, have their affairs, no problems. But he's left out on the street every single night, freezing, he gets a cold, it's miserable. And he... He's Miss Kubelik, played by Shirley MacLaine, and he's slowly starting to fall in love with her. And then their paths cross in um, quite a surprising and quite moving way as well. I would like to know what you think of the female side of it and whether it passes the kind of test we're talking about. Is, is she complex? Is she? Do you think? I think so. I think for the time... She was quite complex. Yep. I mean, it's still very much from his viewpoint, 
but I think partially due to the fact that it's played by Shirley MacLaine, who's one of the most luminous stars who has ever lived. And anytime she says anything, you just believe it and you love her and you fall in love with her. That really helps with the character. I think on the page, she still has an amount of growth because she realizes something very important about herself and sort of, I don't know, learns to love herself to some degree. Yeah, I realize it's hard to talk without I giving know. spoilers, but it's actually, it, it, it was quite progressive for its time, I think, in the area that, yeah. that we're speaking about. So that's something to be celebrated. So the apartment and a good festive choice. Thank you. Yes. Now we're moving on to one, um, another one that Joy chose. And this is what some people call an alternative Christmas movie. And that is Die Hard from 1988, directed by John McTiernan, and of course starring Bruce Willis, Aaron McMahon and Bonnie Bedelia. Um, shall we have a little clip with Bonnie Bedelia? Let's have a look. We have a pregnant woman out there. Relax, she's not due for a couple of weeks, but sitting on that rock isn't doing her back any good. So I would like permission to move her to one of the offices where there's a sofa. No, but I'll have a sofa brought out to you. Good enough? Good enough. And unless you like it messy, I'd start bringing us in groups to the bathroom. Yes, you're right. It will be done. Was there something else? No, thank you. Mr. Takagi chose his people well, Mrs. Gennaro. Miss. Mm. So that's her facing off against the not actually terrorist, but the bad guy played by Alan Rickman. And it's interesting because I felt in a way that's a good clip of showing that she's a very strong character. But rolling your eyes there, Joy, the subject matter she brings his attention is quite gendered, isn't it? Well, she literally becomes the boss of the company and then sorts out maternity rights and toilets. <laughs> and then that's it for her sort of feminism really um, yeah she, she just tends to a pregnant lady and, and then gets kidnapped at the end but I mean I love Die Hard and I also think you know when I watch it I am John McClane I'm not Bonnie Bedelia you know yeah, we all too. are John yeah. McClane jumping off the top of the building but it's so so dodgy in its gender politics that it's all it is satirical about it pretty much it, she literally is safe when she's Miss Gennaro and as soon as he knows that yeah. she's a mother and a wife and Mrs. McLean she's kidnapped and vulnerable and then at the end of she goes from being the hard woman who's divorcing her husband at the top of the film to at the end literally the last thing somebody says to her is you've got a good man take care of him and she also whenever she, even when she's supposedly splitting up with him every time she looks at him she melts she visibly melts uh, so so I think it's it's sort of having fun with us in some ways although I did read that because Bruce was shooting Moonlighting and couldn't be there much they had to beef up the other parts so they beefed up the journalist and the FBI and they clearly didn't beef up Holly so. <laughs> anyone but the female basically Everybody they're like there. oh let's yeah. get the taxi driver yeah let's beef yeah. that role yeah. up yeah yeah. Um, on, on the plus side it is actually quite racially diverse film for yes. its time yes. as well and, and uh, up the blue collar working class very much yeah. so um, not too keen on the Germans though uh, as you notice, no, no, very suave. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Rickman was absolutely brilliant yes. in that film. God rest his soul. So yeah, great choice. I enjoyed watching that again for this. Oh, Thank you. It really um, and now, Harry, you chose a rather different prospect: mm -hmm. The Wizard of Oz. So of course, that's from 1939, starring the great Judy Garland. Um, let's have a little look at the clip, which is a famous one. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? Oh. 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 So there's a flawed woman for you, mm. Harry. Indeed. Um, <laughs> tell us more about the women in Invisibles from your perspective. Well, I was thinking of, you know, films that I connect with Christmas and thinking when you were a kid watching The Wizard of Oz and, and then thinking, wow, Dorothy is actually a very um, independent young woman who is not scared of going off on, a, on an adventure with her, on her own and interacts with three really weak men. And then <laughs> at the end they meet the Wizard of Oz who is pompous, um, fake, 
and um, disingenuous, like the male leaders of our country. <laughs> uh, so um, I thought it sort of resonated um, quite well. And then I, I was having a little read about um, feminism in The Wizard of Oz and discovered that his wife and his mother-in-law were very much part of the suffragette movement and they were really influential on him and how the the book was actually banned for 40 years because they felt that the female character was not conventional enough and uh, I think then he wrote another story after this with really a sort of fluid gender where people aren't he or she and it's all quite politically astute and I can't remember everything I read but it's really interesting it's fascinating yeah, yeah really yeah, yeah. brilliant and I think with the, with the sort of the good witch and the bad witch as well, sort of different sides of femininity. So, yeah, yeah, a lot to unpack there. I, I mean, think. you wouldn't be, you wouldn't think if your child was watching it, like a lot of the old films, you think, oh no, what's this saying? Mm. You know, princesses and uh-huh. castles and being saved. You would think this is cool. You know, this is a little girl that's uh, strong. Yeah, great mm. choices, ladies. Thank you so much. I hope some will enjoy some of them this Christmas. We're going to have a quick look at the year ahead at home. So January will see the start of In Her View season. It's a celebration of the most influential and innovative female voices in documentary. So a few highlights from the sea to the land beyond from Penny Woolcock. That's a century's exploration of the British coastline. There's a portrait of Jason, 1967, Shirley Clark's avant-garde study of a gay African-American cabaret performer. And American Dream from 1990, Barbara Koppel documents an unsuccessful strike against the US food corporation's Hormel Foods. So um, get your eyes around that at home next year. Now, we thought we would cut to the audience now and see if any of you have any questions or comments. Raise your hand, don't be shy. Hi, yeah. Um, Joy, I just wanted to pick up on something that you said earlier about the sweet science of bruising, oh, where yeah. you're interested in working with four leads. And I was kind of thinking that awards season's coming around and thinking back to last awards season where we had a few movies like The Favourite, mm. where there were like sort of three big hitting women yeah. at the top. And tying in with things that we've spoken about, about kind of the idea of the lone strong woman in a film being sort of a bit old hat now. Mm. I mean, how much do you think we might be moving toward, like, uh, the female ensemble? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have heard it discussed that there's... I don't know if some awards do best ensemble, but that there there is a really strong case for that. Because I don't think actors like divvying things up into supporting. And, and there's so many instances where actually supporting parts have been put forward for the lead. Or, you know, if you have something like Judy Dench in... in was it Elizabeth? And she was barely in it and it happens quite often and and it just shows how we put these structures on things but actually the world isn't quite like that so that was partly the impetus because I I was on this writing course where there was a very very strong hero dynamic and whose story is it and and I absolutely understand that model and it is easier completely if if there's a single protagonist and, and we go with them but it isn't the only way and we just have to have more diversity of of stories. It's more interesting to step outside of ourselves and empathise with many people. Yeah, I think um, actually, especially when you're writing a relationship story, uh, I really wanted to make it an even-handed story and it was quite interesting. Sometimes I could feel like I was handing the baton over to the other person and we were sort of going into their shoes for a while and then we would hand the baton back. So I quite enjoyed that different yeah, sort of shift. Great question. Thank you very much. It remains to me to thank my wonderful guests today. Thank you, Joy Wilkinson. Thank, thank you, Harry Whitliffe. And thank you, Clarice Lockery. Round of applause. You've been fantastic. Thank you to Hedda Archbold of HLA Productions for producing. Thank you to Jane Long for audio producing. Thanks to our intern, Heather Dempsey. A special thank you to Home Manchester for hosting us for a full year. We've loved being here. You can follow me at Anna Smith Journo. And our next podcast will be live from the International Film Festival Rotterdam with exciting guests. So do come over there if you can. So thank you all for being Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.